All right, so uh, the theme of the conference is accessibility, and I took a different take on that. I'm talking about access ability. So the ability to access your, your data and your devices from wherever you are. Let me get this thing clipped on here. Sound check, one, two, now we're good, right? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, uh, subtitle, look, mod, no cloud. I'm AJ O'Neill. I already got kind of an introduction. The one thing I want you to know about me is I'm a technophobic technologist, which means that I believe that singularity is going to cause everyone to get extremely depressed and commit suicide. So, uh, I'm not, I don't have an optimistic outlook of the future of technology, and I'm doing everything that I can to correct it, but I'm only one person, so I hope that you'll join me. Um, and uh, that was a little morose. I'm not quite that severe about it. Anyway, uh, I work at Big Squid, so uh, very grateful to them. They are funding my dreams. Uh, so I, I uh, work daytime for them, and then I'm moonlighting as people. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the, the technologies that I've been building with that with a, a couple of other people to help you have access to your data and your devices. Um, the reason that I'm doing this, like I, I want I want to empower exactly the kind of people that have been presenting in this room. So if you've been staying in this room and you've been watching these talks, they kind of have this common theme of like offline first or devices or something like that. And what I'm aiming to do is to empower those people. So if you're one of those people, like I really hope that I can empower you. And uh, the way that I'm doing that is with three different uh, technologies that I'm working on. The least developed is called Hub, I want you to have a physical device in your home that is basically uh, the equivalent of Heroku or AWS, something that's very cloudy, something that connects your devices together, and um, that you have complete ownership of. It's yours, it's not going to disappear, it's not going to go out of business, unless you go out of business, aka die, but then it could still live on. It, it, this, this is your, your chance for immortality. Um, Greenlock is a technology that I'm developing so that you can have control. What this does is it, it works with Let's Encrypt to give you automated certificates. So is anybody in here developing with Express? Okay. Would any of you like to have HTTPS on your Express apps? Okay. Go check this out. Like it's, you will like this. And we'll talk about it a little bit more. The third technology is Telebit, and the reason I created this is so that we can have convenience, and these three things come together to give, to give you that empowerment that I'm talking about. Telebit is the ability to access your stuff from anywhere. So I'll go into more about what that means. So my, my, my values that I'm trying to communicate here are ownership, control, and convenience, and I'm doing that with Hub, the physical device, Greenlock for security, and Telebit to give convenience and access. And what I think is really great, I'm really, really grateful to all of the big cloud companies that have done all the research and development that have made it super easy to clone everything that they're doing so that soon we will be able to have all of that cloudiness on our own devices and our own homes. And these are the technologies that I'm making the prediction are going to bring that to pass. Like, I see pretty much the entire internet infrastructure for cloud-type software is being written in Go, JavaScript and Node.js make it super easy to write lightweight apps that even a high school student can do. And then Rust gives us the power of C that we can plug into Node. So if we need Node to be performant, we can use Rust to do it. Also, I think Rust is one of the, uh, the uh, WebAssembly targets. So um, I, I think these are great technologies. And uh, w one of the reasons that I think this future is at hand is we have $37.50 servers available to us immediately within two days. How many of you have a Raspberry Pi? So hopefully most of you, great. So I'm hoping that, how many of you, how many of you have the Raspberry Pi and you've never done anything useful with it? It's like 70% of the hands that went up before. I want to change that. I want you to be able to do something with your Raspberry Pi, okay? Um, this is another thing I find really promising, not quite in the $35 range, 
But this to me means that we're on the verge of having storage for the everyman. What's $1,000 today will be $100 tomorrow. So I'm excited to see that it, there is advances in uh, 3D NAN and that we're actually going to get storage that's more than a pittance that can't even hold half my photos or a tenth of my music collection. Does anybody else here have like huge collections of music or movies and you know your phone, your MacBook just doesn't do it? Yeah. So I'm excited about that. Now, hopefully the reason that you're here is because you're having this problem, or at least if you're having this problem, I can solve it for you. Um, but it's not, it's not we can't connect out to the internet, it's that well, we can't connect in. So uh, joke, why couldn't the T-Rex connect to the internet? Why? He couldn't reach. <laughs> so, um, so Telebit is about accessibility. Uh, I'd like it if you have your laptop open, go ahead and go to this website right now and take a peek at it. But um, this, this, is, this is basically a reverse VPN. It's uh, a, a, a proxy service. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever used Ingrok or Local Tunnel, it's similar to that in the way that it functions. The purpose is a little different. Um, and it's open source. So you can actually run the server on your own infrastructure. And this is really important when we start to, to look at the peer-to-peer -peer web. If lots of people are running relay services and you could connect to one that you trust, then, then um, you can break out of local host. You could, you could be hosting a website from uh, 10,000 feet in an airplane. Um, and, and I'm serious about that. So the ability to, to, to not be constrained to local host, to be able to get out of that box is really important. Um, one is the loneliest number. I don't think it's the loneliest number. I think 127.0.0.1 is the loneliest number because the party is going on all around and it can hear it, but it can't get in there. And that's, that's part of the problem that, that Telebit is aimed to solve. What I want to do is make your network connectivity unstoppable. I want to give your T-Rex of an app arms so that you can start using web hooks so that you can do peer-to-peer -peer apps where you have a domain that two things are connecting to each other. Um, so brief, 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 brief history of the internet, because I, I, I'm kind of maybe talking abstract. I hope that you're connecting with what I'm saying, but to, to nail this down. So the internet comes from this, unfortunately. This is not how the internet was designed, but this is how the internet works. So you want to visit a web page, you open your browser, you, uh, type Google into your address book, and then your address book looks up the phone number and it dials out. But Google doesn't dial back. Google can't reach you, right? You can't set up on your local host and, and, or, or on your local machine and give access to the rest of the world, even though you've got supposedly an internet connection. Supposedly, you have broadband, but it's not working for you. Uh, I don't remember what I was going to do with that image. So th this is what people, people think the internet's like this. The way the internet was designed is like this. But the way that we're using it is a really bad game of Pong. <laughs> right? So we've got someone else's computer that's doing all the stuff when we've got two perfectly good computers at the home or the office or wherever, and they can't get to each other because of, of these firewalls. And there's some technologies that could help us get around that. So what I'm going through right now is like, what are the existing solutions? Um, so you've got UPnP is a protocol that your Xbox uses, that Skype uses to open up ports on your router. And NetPnP and PCP are the same thing, they're just different variations. UPnP is the most widely supported, where supported is very loose terms. This is one of the reasons that, that many of you probably don't even think about other people being able to access your computer. Maybe you're a consultant and you need to share something with a client, you wish you had a way to do that. But many of you, you haven't even thought about it. Like, it's never come up because it's never been a capability because these protocols, although they work sometimes, they don't work really well and nothing integrates with them. 
um, or not nothing, but few things. Um, so another, another thing that we have to try to get around this problem of connectivity is MDNS. That only works locally. So it gets you out of local host, but it leaves you at 192 or 10.0. And this is otherwise known as Apple Print Services. That's its primary name. If you look in your Windows processes and you want to know if, if uh, MDNS is working for you, it's going to be called Apple Print Services or perhaps Bonjour. Um, and then there's a Microsoft one called DNSSD, but MDNS is kind of the one that's, that's taken over. So that helps us locally, but it's, it's confined. Um, another thing we have is SOX5. Anybody ever used a SOX5 proxy? So one cool thing that this does is it lets you get into your home network or office network or whatever if you've already configured the firewall. So if you've, if you've solved this problem, then you're ready to solve this problem. It lets, you, it lets you in, but it doesn't let anybody else in. What this could be used for is like watching Netflix videos while you're on vacation in Europe from your home IP. So that, like, that's kind of a solution. Um, so again, it gets you through the firewall, but it doesn't, it's just you. Um, and that, that looks like, like this, in case anybody's wondering. Uh, you've got OpenVPN. OpenVPN is like a SOX5 proxy, because this, this can run with SSH, SOX5. That's really cool. Um, OpenVPN actually requires like kernel-y stuff, but it gives you access to the entire network, not just, um, not just web traffic. Uh, then we've got DHT, everybody talks about the blockchain right now, um, and, and Torrent, those two technologies use uh, DHT as name resolution to be able to get things between point and point. Now DHT is actually really promising until you look at this. If I want to go to example.com, I got it figured out. If I want to go to a DHT address, not so much, but it does, it does get around the firewall problem. It will allow you to connect. It's just not so easy, because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't remember that if that were my home address. I've got enough problems with 192, right? So these, these, these things don't quite give us the solution that we need. We want to be unstoppable. So web protocols work actually really well, aside from the firewall problem. If we could just use web traffic, we don't have to get into the command line, we don't have to learn crazy uh, kernel level stuff or IP tables or any of that. Web works really well, and it also gets us over firewalls. That, um, like, it, you know, if you go to the library and try to use SSH, anybody ever been in the library try to use SSH, access denied? Or any other type of network, hotel network. How many people use SSH in here? Okay, good, good. Okay, so if you've ever had that problem, um, you know, you, you can't do that. So web works really well. We get security and we get naming conventions and stuff. Um, and, a, and a proxy kind of works like this. So you want to access a server and then the server needs to access some virtual instance or maybe a real instance. And it has to append an address so that it knows where the connection came from. And this is fine in a tight system like an Amazon region or a digital ocean region or somewhere where you've got physical wires connecting things. But it doesn't work in our environment where we want to connect peer devices because it's constrained. So in the, in the peer world, the easiest way to do this if we're going to use the web is to have some sort of relay. Now, like I said before, if we run open source relays only with those that we trust, then we could have some really cool connectivity. Um, but to start out, to get things started, I don't think that we're going to go straight to a blockchain or we're going to go straight to some like DHTs. I think those technologies will enable us, but we need to take the perspective of what works now, what do people already understand in order to get there. And so, when we have a, a connection going from, you know, say our device to a relay to some other device of ours, we get a problem, which is that the relay sees all the data going in and all the data coming out. But since we have TLS, TLS has an interesting property that few people know about called a server name indicator. So when you initiate a connection with something, with TLS, 
it has an unencrypted header that comes first that says, I'm TLS, I'm version 1.2, I have this server name, I support H, the, the H2 is the underlying protocol, or HTTP 1.1 is the underlying protocol that I'm encapsulating, um, and some information like that. What that allows us to do is to actually be able to route traffic without decrypting it first. That allows us to get from one end to the other. Now we have this other problem. If I get from one end to the other with a relay, how am I going to not get that red bar? Has anybody tried to set up SSL for themselves and you, you get that red bar, the warning, and it doesn't let you pass? Anybody? OK. So this, this, is, this is a problem that Greenlock is designed to overcome. This is written in Node.js. You can use it as a command line um, without it. But uh, it's, it's designed to work with Express. And this is to help us so that when the connection goes through to the other side, instead of having you know, someone, if you're just using it by yourself, that's fine to get the red, the red thing. But if you're sharing with someone else, you want them to have a seamless experience. And this is why I built Greenlock. Um, and it's used by Mozilla, uh, by the Beaker Project. Um, there's some guy at IBM that was blogging about it, so I can only assume that he's doing something with it at IBM. So it's, it's catching hold, and it's catching hold in this community of people, primarily, that are working in these, these device-type spaces. So I'm really excited to see that. And, and this uses Let's Encrypt so that you get a valid HTTPS certificate. So now you can relay the traffic. You can have it encrypted end to end. And even though this, you know, some argue this, this isn't peer to peer because there's a relay, I argue that it is. Because what gives you control is encryption. Encryption, because if we're speaking peer to peer in a room, it's not a controlled environment because everyone can hear. If we go take our own room aside, now we have a controlled environment. Now we're in control of that conversation, where the data goes, who has access to it. And that's what encryption provides. So even though there may be a relay involved, you have a true private channel to have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation between devices. So we, we have another problem, um, which is that it, it, this doesn't work like the cloud infrastructure, like AWS or DigitalOcean, because you're not confined to the same region, and these devices between relays aren't necessarily trusted. So just because a device connects on the back end and says, hey, forward me traffic, for example, .com, doesn't mean that that device should get traffic, for example, .com, which is different from our, our typical cloud environment. Uh, so what we actually need to do is add yet another header on top of the, so there's the TLS packet. The relay needs to put a, a address packet on top of that then send that to, say, the node application, and then it's able to respond back, again, changing the source address for the destination address in this tunnel, and that's technically how we can build relays that work not just in hosted cloud providers, but in our own homes. So, yeah, it goes back just like I said. So hopefully, my, my hope with this, and, and I hope I'm not off base, was to give scope and context to what the problems are with the internet right now, what existing solutions people use to get around these, these blocking ping pong problems, and what I see is, is a way forward in the, with what I've built. So if we, everything over HTTPS, we can get SSH, we can get VPN, we can get, obviously, web. We can pretty much tunnel any protocol over HTTPS because TLS gives us everything we need. It gives us a destination. It gives us an underlying application address. And it, it gives us, uh, because of Let's Encrypt, it gives us security that's trusted everywhere. And it's, it's extremely accessible. You don't need an app for it. You can do it in a web browser. That makes you unstoppable. So the web is easy, and it's not blockable. Some of this other stuff, not always so easy. Like, I can't even fit this example in a single line. Um, so what I, oh, I was supposed to do the demo up front. I'm going to do a little demo for you, if I can. Um, no. So this right here, oh, I forgot to do this. 
You're just going to have to trust me. So I brought a Raspberry Pi. When I plug it into here, it will serve a web page. In fact, I'll plug it in. I think it, I think it was this one. I'm going to plug this in. And somebody else, if you want to, you can go to that first web address. In about 30 seconds or so, that's going to be available. So if you try to go right now to Bitter Shrimp 73 Telebit website, you're not going to get anything. Once this boots up, actually you won't because I have to log in and start it because system D and stuff. Never mind. OK, so what we're going to do, this, this is my home computer right now. So let me go here. And uh, let me try to make this bigger. So I'm really into music. And I have a music collection that isn't available on cloud services. Oh. It's going to work. It's going to work. There's still, there's still occasional issues. I think, it, I think it's going to work. We'll go, to, we'll go to the other one. Let's see. This is, my, uh, this is my work computer. See if it loads. All I've got in there is my, my SSH keys. Let me try one more time. Go into this one. No? OK. I was going to play some music for you guys. It's not, it's not perfect yet, but it's getting there. Um, OK. So oh, well, on this computer, actually, well, I, I don't want to take the time to do it right now. But, but I, can, I can run Telebit on this computer. I can just run the command. And then any of you in this room would be able to access this computer um, as well. So. This is what Greenlock looks like if you want to use it. If you've got an Express app and you want to secure it, this is what it looks like with Greenlock. It's that simple. You can get an HTTPS certificate for your sites. OK? Um, let's see. We, we built this tool. This is part of the Telebit suite called S-Client. This will let you take any encrypted traffic that is, uh, say you're connecting to whatever.com, it's encrypted, and you want to be able to tell that or something. Debugging this kind of a debugging tool. So you can run this, and it will unwrap the TLS from example.com. So now you could use Telnet or Netcat or whatever else. Has anybody ever tried to debug an HTTPS connection and it's encrypted, so it's very hard to debug? That's, that's what this is for. Um, and you can also use it in your SSH to tunnel SSH over HTTPS. Let's see. I was going to show the SOX, SOX proxy. I'll skip that. OK, here's something else that you can do. Um, so I integrated S client into Telebit. So when you run Telebit, and this is a node app, it'll open up SSH, configure it properly. And if you're running Telebit on one computer with SSH turned on and Telebit on another computer as, as a client to connect to it, you don't have to do any configuration. Otherwise, you've got to do a tiny bit of configuration that looks something like this in your SSH config or that looks like that, which is still kind of confusing. All right. I included rsync into it. I put the SOX proxy into it. And I'm going to go ahead and show you what this process looks like. Uh, no. I can't, I can't do it. It won't let me. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it anyway. No, no, that, that was a slide. That was literally a slide. OK, let me see if I can do this real quick. <laughs> OK, so I've already got this installed, but I'm going to show you what the install process looks like anyway. Or I'll just skip ahead to it, because it's already installed. So I do Telebit, HTTP, and then my shared folder. And because I am doing development on it, it's not working right now. Come on. What's going on? All right, cool. So 
if somebody goes to www.the.dj, this computer right here that's behind all these you know, firewalls and all that is now also serving a website. So it's just a bunch of test files. So that's this computer right here. And if I, if I SSH into this Raspberry Pi, which it looks like I've got enough time to do, I need to change that. Whoops, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. What does it do? I can't see the screen very well. What did it do? Okay, there we are. Sorry, that needs to be pi. Come on. Yes, okay. So if the demo gods are with us, So basically, what, what I'm proposing here is if you have a Raspberry Pi, get it booted up, run that Telebit install script, run Telebit SSH auto after you've changed the SSH password, run Telebit HTTP shared, I'm gonna make a shared folder, And let me see what my address is, because I forgot. Okay, bittershrimp73.telebit.website. Okay, so if you go to this site, let me go back here. I want, it would be cool if somebody else could verify this. Okay, so, it's bitter-shrimp73.telebit.website, I think it was, right? Yeah, okay, so that URL, if you want to, you can now SSH into this. The username's pi, the password's raspberry. Okay, so if you, wa if you want to, feel free to SSH in. When I unplug it, it goes away, okay? This is the future that I'm envisioning. And, and I, maybe I don't quite communicate it clearly, so I hope that you will ask some questions, because I know that I don't always communicate as effectively as I, I wish that I could. But this is the future I'm envisioning, where every device you own has a domain, and, and we, we've already added the custom domain feature to Telebit, so you don't have to get a random domain, you could get a custom one, but it's not pushed to the live, the production yet. Um, but I'm envisioning something where you can access any device over HTTPS and you can access any protocol underneath of HTTPS. So tunneling, SSH, OpenVPN, SOX, all of these different connectivity protocols that allow us network cloudiness, they all can be tunneled underneath of SSH because, I mean, HTTPS and TLS, because they give us the capability to be able to route and all of these problems can be worked through first at the HTTPS layer, then we can tackle some of the harder problems like how do we break through the firewall in a more effective way? Like once we can get people connected at all, then we can go try to solve the DHT problems and things like that. But I hope, I hope that some of you are visionaries and this opens your mind and unblocks you from thinking like I have to use cloud services, I have to use Dropbox, I can't do anything with my computer. It's a useless dumb terminal. It's not true. So, I don't think I had any more really important slides. Yeah, just, you're offline, but you don't have to be. You can be unstoppable. So I wanna hear questions. And none of them are gonna be dumb because I said stuff that most people don't understand natively. Yes. It sounds like all of this is still dependent on like a, a relay server out in s somewhere on the internet, right? 
Yeah, so yeah. right now, we have a relay server that we run. You get a private peer-to-peer -peer connection because it's encrypted end-to-end. -end. I don't see that data, right? The other thing is that you can run this relay yourself. It's open source. Okay, so you could put that relay anywhere. Yeah, you can configure your router and put it on a Raspberry Pi, run the Raspberry Pi as the relay. And there's an option with Telebit to, you know, the dash dash relay, right? Um, the other thing is that, remember, this is a stopgap solution. I'm not proposing this is the permanent solution, that we always should always use relays. What I'm saying is we have an opportunity to try something new out, to build peer-to-peer -peer applications, to be able to access our devices and share our data that we, we didn't have before or was there but was hidden from us. And as we develop and iterate on that, we can develop better tools to auto-configure routers and things like that. That is in our pipeline personally for our development with Telebit. Telebit will have the ability to use uh, NAT PNP, UPnP, and PCP to, to make your device directly accessible and use dynamic DNS to make sure that the domain is pointed there. But at this time, this solution works, it works well, and it's something that you can use a service or you can run on your own. So it gives you choice and control. Other questions? Yes. So it's a telebit.website. <clears throat> it's a telebit.website. The bitter shrimp seventy three is just a, a subdomain that you made up at all. Just yeah. So so if dynamic. You, if you go to telebit.io and you run the command, like when you install it, you go through this process. You type in your email address. You get a confirmation email, and then it assigns you a random domain. That's how it works right now. So that's oh, the, okay. the the free product, the open source product. And then that routes to that that routes through the relay to my computer. Yeah. So when you when you open the confirmation email. It already has a session with that device and there's a pairing code in the email. So when you click on the link and type in the pairing code, which is like one, two, three, just a tiny measure of security to make sure that within that slight window of time that you're actually the person that's on that device, um, then it pairs that domain with that device. Okay, cool. So one thing I wanna know, and this might hurt my feelings and that's okay, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm okay with my feelings being hurt. But how many of you see utility in this that you want to use. That doesn't hurt my feelings at all. How many of you feel like you have the understanding you need to go home to your Raspberry Pi or take your, your current computer and run this? Wow. How many of you have questions about how it works or problems that might occur? All right, now, buy off questions. Where, what, yes? So I saw um, towards the beginning you mentioned something about Hub. Is that something that's more designed for non-technical users? Because, well, sure, I could set something up like this myself. What if, you know, I had a friend or someone else who, you know, who valued these same things but didn't have the technical expertise to, you know, go through all of this that you've shown us? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I totally skipped over that. Yeah, so the device hub, all of this stuff is, is working towards, it's progressive, right? Like, first we needed SSA or HTTPS, then we needed accessibility and convenience, then we need ownership. And hub is going to be the consumer product that your, you know, mom, grandpa, sister could use. All right, some other questions. I saw one over here. Who was it? So the presentation's technically over, so go ahead and clap. So we, oh, no, no, we got one question here, and then you can clap, and then we'll answer others. Yes, Aaron. Hello. So how are you, as, uh, as my friend pointed out here, one of the reasons that we have all these firewalls and so forth is to provide us extra security, at least in theory, right? You tend to think of your home network as being reasonably secure because you've got a firewall that just doesn't let stuff in 
Nat protects me. And now you've just enabled me to skip Nat entirely and people can get to me, at least where I open it up. How do you, what do you have to say about, um, about the secure by default that you've just sort of removed? So I, this is a common misconception, right? This is kind of like when Verizon reduced call quality and then ran the can you hear me now campaign. Like people think that their firewall is doing something that it is not really necessarily doing. Like you have your Xbox, you have Skype, you have all these applications that work on various different protocols that are doing this hole punching already. So this is actually not introducing anything new that you're not already, that other devices in your home aren't already doing. This is just giving you the power to do what you want with it. So we're not, we're not changing anything about the capability of the firewall. The firewall works as intended to keep out unwanted traffic. This is just another avenue for a device to accept wanted traffic. And obviously, from our perspective, it's really important to build security into that that you don't have to worry about. Like, I filed a detailed bug report in Node that if you're interested in understanding some vulnerabilities in the TLS layer of Node, um, it's, uh, email me, yes. It's, actually, no, 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 no. No, I've got, I've got a, on YouTube, if you just Google Greenlock, let me, let me do this real quick. Um, yeah, let's just Google Greenlock. I don't know what that other word is there. I don't know, that's not what I want. Just green lock. Okay, so there's, this is a three part thing. Part three, I talk about some of the security concerns. So hopefully if you have any questions about like, am I any good at security, do you know what I'm doing? Probably better than most people you know. And, and I show a demonstration of a flaw and then how we make sure that you're not vulnerable to it. So that type of security is going to be covered by our tools so that you don't have mistakes. Okay, thanks.